Yes. We're very pleased to present tonight author Ricky Gard Diamond. The director for the Vermont Commission on Women, Carrie Brown. And we have the cartoonist from the book tonight, Tico, uh, Pico Todd. Excuse me. We're very excited for the celebration and discussion on the state <coughs> of women's economics. Um, these two women and our cartoonists, they're strong advocates and resources for women in Vermont and beyond. And I've just learned that Pico Todd is also an advocate for elephants. Yay! 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 Um, Pico and Ricky met while teaching at Vermont College, and it looks as though it's a nice Vermont College reunion here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'd like to let you know that Carrie will be speaking first for about 10 minutes, and then Ricky will present her new book, Screwnomics. I wanted to have a copy to hold up. You have your copy? Somebody, everyone has a copy. <laughs> um, so I guess I don't have to urge everyone to buy a copy, but I urge you to buy a copy and one for your friends and everybody you know. Um, we will be taking questions from the audience. We will break for refreshments. We have cake that we'll be cutting, cheese and crackers, and there is wine compliments of the author. Um, and then we'll have time for book signing from both the cartoonist and the author. Um, oh, I also wanted to talk about the Econo Girlfriend. Will you be talking about the Econo Girlfriend or Boyfriend book group? Uh -huh. um, so as I said, pick up a copy and pick up some for your friends. I'd like to remind you to please mute or turn off your cell phones and to let you know that the front door is now locked. Um, if you need to leave during the event, the back door is open. The back door is this way to my right. The bathroom is also located at the back of the store to the right of the back door. And I'd like to thank the Vermont Arts Council for featuring tonight's event as a Vermont Arts 2018 program. Wow. Feel free to pick up a Vermont Arts sticker. They're at the front desk at the counter, along with the book and also some handouts about the book and how to start a book group. Um, I'd also like to thank Orca Media. They're here filming tonight's event. If you'd like to see the video, please feel free to sign up on our newsletter sheet. It was being passed around. Um, it's also a nice place, our newsletter, to learn about future events and I'd like to let you know that next Friday, May 11th, we're hosting author Bernd Heinrich, who will present his new book of essays, A Naturalist at Large. And that comes out on May 8th, that book. Um, I'd like to introduce Carrie Brown. As I said, she will be speaking first. She has many years in service to women's empowerment, including working on legislation on equal pay, parental leave, and economic equity security. She has a Master's of Public Administration from Norwich and is the director of the Vermont Commission on Women. She also has a great sense of humor, which fits nicely with the book. Help me welcome Mr. <coughs> Carrie Brown. Thank you, Sam, and thank you, Ricky, for writing this great book, and thank you, Pico, for illustrating this great book. I'm really, really happy to be here. I'm, it just thrills me to the bottom of my heart to see this room filled up with people who want to talk about women's economic security in Vermont. And uh, the Vermont Commission on Women has been around since 1964. We've been working on economic equity and security for women since 1964. We've got a little ways to go. We're still working on it. Um, and I just, I, I just have to say that in this room, we have currently uh, one of our commissioners, Lisa Senegal is over here. We have Susan Ritz, who's working with us on the Change the Story project that I'll tell you a little bit more about. We have Ann Sarka who is a former executive director of the Vermont Commission on Women. Yeah. So there is, anybody else have any connection? Kathy Johnson did some work for the Commission on Women at one point. Anybody else have any connections here? 54 years, it's been a really, really long time. So the good news is that Vermont has been supporting our work of increasing opportunities and reducing discrimination for women for 54 years. The bad news is that still we're still at it. <laughs> So I, um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the economic status of women in Vermont. Um, as I say, we've been working on this for a long time, so have many others with, in, in Vermont. So the Vermont Women's Fund and Vermont Works for Women are two organizations that have also been spending decades on this issue. The three of our organizations decided we would get together, we would combine forces, and we would take an approach that looks at policy, philanthropy, and program all together to see if we couldn't advance women's economic status 
much more quickly than we've been seeing happen so far in Vermont. And so that's a change the story project. And the, one of the first things that we did was a really in-depth research project that took a couple of years. We came out with four reports, which I have a copy of each one here. They're all, of course, online, so you can go and take a look at them. And they really describe what's going on for women economically right now. So I wanna share a little with you of what we see happening right now and then a little bit about what's being done in response to this. And then Ricky's gonna be able to talk about a little bit more about kind of why and what's really going on underneath all of this. All right, so bear with me as I race through some data for you. I have no visual aids whatsoever. So you're just gonna to have to listen and hang on and I'll try not to overwhelm you. And this is a tiny little taste of what we have. All right, so as many of you probably know, women are 51% of the population in Vermont. 66% of Vermont women are in the labor force. That means they're working, they have jobs, and that compares to 69% of men. So it's really pretty similar, very close, and we're also a little bit above the national average for women in the labor force. A one interesting thing that we found when we looked at how many people were working based on their ages over the course of a lifetime, the peak for women in the labor force is during the child rearing years. And so we might think that when you have kids, you have babies, you have children to take care of, that's when you step back from work and work less, which is much more true for women than it is for men. But overall, women are working much more. They're working in the most at that time in their life. And so I think that's really important to recognize. Um, one, of the, one of the things that that um, reminds us about is the importance of childcare and how women need to work, and so they need childcare, as do as do dads who are also in the workforce. Um, we, when we looked at uh, the research that we did, was women who work full time, and because it was, it gave us a clean comparisons. But the reality is that many more women work part time than men do. 25% of women in Vermont are working part-time, and that compares to 10% of men. So it's two and a half times the rate for women to work part-time. And we don't know all the reasons why they do that, but we do know that when they're asked, women are nine times more likely to say they choose part-time work because of family responsibilities. And so women are spending much more time taking their kids to the doctor, um, picking them up from soccer practice, uh, taking care of the aging parent or grandparent, it just falls disproportionately on the shoulders of women, which takes time out from how much they can be in the workforce and how much money they can be making. 71% um, of the part-time workers in Vermont are women. So it's really your typical part-time Vermonter is a woman. And uh, Partially for these reasons and, and many others, women in Vermont are much more likely to live in poverty. They're more likely to live in economic insecurity than men are. 57% of women who are working full-time in Vermont are making less than $30,000. And 57% of men are making over $30,000. So it's interestingly kind of exactly flipped and we see that disparity there. Overall, when we look at Vermont families, 13% of them are living in poverty. And this is meaning below the federal poverty line, which I can't tell you what the, that number is. Does anybody know what that is right now? It's, it's shockingly low. You would be flabbergasted at how little money that actually is. And so that's 13% of Vermont families. But when you look at the families that are headed by a single mom, then it's 37%. So that's a really dramatic number of people. That's a, that's a lot of, of neighbors and um, friends and people who, who live around us in Vermont. And then even the women who are not living in poverty that low are still having a pretty rough time. So every couple of years the Vermont Legislature's Joint Fiscal Office does an analysis of how much it actually costs to live in Vermont. They come up with something called a basic needs budget. And it's kind of a realistic look of how much money do you need to meet your basic needs. And 43% of women who are working full-time in Vermont, 43% are not making that much money. So this is full-time work and they're not able to meet their basic needs. So that's a, that's a little grim. <laughs> Sorry, this 
this is a lot of bad news all at once. <laughs> I apologize for that. Uh, so when, as women are making less money over the course of their lifetimes, when they hit retirement, that's when it really shows up. So less earnings means you have less in savings. It means you are less likely to have a pension. It means you've put less into Social Security over the course of your life. And so when Vermont men, on average, are getting $20,000 in Social Security, which is not a heck of a lot of money, Vermont women, $10,000. It's half of what men are getting. So this is a time in life that everybody is more likely to be economically vulnerable, but it's much, much worse for women. And um, some of the, we looked at a little bit of some of the, the uh, reasons why the earnings are less. We looked at where women work. It won't surprise most of you to know that women tend to be clustered in lower paying jobs. Men tend to be clustered in higher paying jobs. So for instance, an elementary school teacher in Vermont makes about $45,000 and an engineer in Vermont makes about $75,000. And of course, most elementary school teachers are women, most engineers are men. And so one of the responses that people have had to this is to encourage more women to go into science, technology, engineering, and math, to more women to become engineers, which is a great approach and really something we need to be focusing on. But we also do need to be asking, why is it that the elementary school teachers are getting paid so little? And if you look at um, early childhood teachers, uh, it's it's much, much lower than that. It's, it, yeah. <laughs> It's less than the livable wage in Vermont, which is pretty low already. Um, so, so it's something we need to think about our values. The, the work that women do is valued less than the work that men do. And when we do a little bit of a historical look at where women are working, this is one of the surprising things that we found out. We looked at where women were clustered in 1976 and where they're clustered in 2013. So. Um, in 1976, 98% of office administrators were women, secretaries. How many, what percentage do you think right now are women? Anyone have any guesses? Same. Close to same. That. It's exactly the same. <laughs> it's 98%. It's 98 and we looked also at teachers. 66% of teachers back then were women. Now 67% of teachers are women. So it's a little bit higher. Nurses back then, 100% of nurses were women. There were just virtually no men doing it. Now it's a little bit better, 93% of nurses are women. So we'll count the progress where we can, <laughs> wherever we can. Um, so that's that's um, a little bit of, of grim news. I have more bad news, but I think I'm going to keep telling it all to you. <laughs> and instead, I'll talk a little bit about some more hopeful stuff, some, some of the kinds of things that, that's happening in response to this. So the Commission on Women uh, works at a, we, we don't run programs, and that's why part of why we partner with Vermont Works for Women, because they do. But we do things like monitor legislation and provide uh, a, a testimony to the legislature if they're considering legislation. So some of the things that they're working on right now that we've been contributing to are a bill that actually um, has passed both the House and the Senate now that prohibits employers from requiring you to give them your salary history when you're applying for a job. And this is significant because if women are earning less and then they go get a new job and the boss says, I'm going to give you a 20% raise over what you got at your last job, aren't I generous? <laughs> it, it's if they're doing it to the men too, you're just perpetuating that disparity. And um, so this is passed both the House and the Senate. The governor is very supportive of it. And so this is something that we're seeing happen all across the country. It's one of the, the newest <coughs> tools in the, the arsenal against um, the pay inequity. We're also working on paid family leave, which um, has passed the House and is in the Senate right now, and I don't know what's going to happen with it. It's having a hard time going through the Senate, but this would be a very modest benefit that would allow people to take a little time off when they have a baby or when they have to care for a sick family member. Um, and then also there's a bill that is trying to combat sexual harassment that, has, again, has passed the House and is in the Senate right now. And this is one that's really important to us, not only because, of course, sexual harassment is you know, unjust, um, 
but because it has a real impact on women's economic security. If you, uh, you know, the, the majority of women who experience harassment on the job end up leaving their jobs, and a lot of them end up going to lesser paying jobs or jobs with, with less responsibility. And so it can be a huge, huge setback and roadblock to a woman's career and to her economic security. So that's why we care about that one. And then I'll just say one more thing that you all can do as well little pitch for this is a project of change the story it's called conversation cards it's a deck of cards that includes both data some of which i shared with you and also thought-provoking questions if you get together in a group of your friends or a school group or a book group or something that you can use these to have a conversation around gender roles and around gender stereotypes and we have a whole bunch of these if you want to take one of these, I will give them to you. You can take them out and make good use of them, and we'll just ask you for a little follow-up. But uh, those are those are there, and afterwards we can talk more about those. So I will um, now that I've shared a little bit about what things look like for mm. women in Vermont economically. Ricky's going to be able to tell us a little bit more about why and where this came from and what's really going on here uh, to kind of try to get underneath all of that. Um, so I'm really happy to be here with Ricky. I met Ricky a few years ago when I wrote an article for Vermont Woman and she was my editor and she was so impressive as an editor. I gotta tell you, she took, I'm a decent writer, okay, I can write. And yet what came out of Ricky's hands was so much better and I was so appreciative of that. And um, so Ricky became the founding editor of Vermont Woman in 1985. She's still a contributing editor and uh, she spent over 20 years teaching writing and literature, feminist and media studies at Vermont College at Norwich University. And at, at all this while, she was publishing articles and fiction. In 1999, she published a novel called Second Sight, and that was reissued by HarperCollins in 2000. And she's working on another novel right now I hear. <laughs> and in 2000, um, sorry, now I can't read my things, 2011, you were awarded the National Newspaper Association Award for an article series called An Economy of Our Own. So you see where we're, we're going here. And then in 2014, she won a Hedgebrook Fellowship for her work on this book, Screwnomics. So now we get to hear all about it. Thank you so much for being here right now. Please just thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, provocative um, information about what you've discovered here in Vermont in particular. I think that kind of local uh, information is so valuable for us to have and I don't know how many other states are doing that kind of thing. I, I, I know that Massachusetts is doing a little bit, mm -hmm. um, some of the New England states, but um, that's, that's something that I hope we can spread and um, I, I'm so happy that Change the Story has kind of uh, adopted, uh, the Screwnomics is another piece of the toolkit possibly for starting those conversations that we really need to have. I, I would love to give you some good news, but I'm afraid it's even worse as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> You're all being screwed. <laughs> and systemically. And, uh, and so that's part of what, uh, what uh, Screwnomics is, is really about. Um, I, I want to um, thank uh, Samantha uh, Culver for putting this whole event together coming up with this incredible cake, you have to see it over here. And take a picture of it, please, because you know it's going to break my heart to see it cut up into pieces. But no, I want you to all to have it. I didn't spare any money. There's the best box wine you can buy. <laughs> and, and I am of the opinion that economics really should not be talked about except among friends with some nibbles and a glass of wine. That really is the best way to approach it. Um, I, I really am um, happy to say that I saw something on PBS about independent bookstores like this. Don't you love this place? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. They, they are 
actually making a comeback because a community of readers is so valuable to our communities and I'm so happy to know that that is happening. So I encourage you to, um, if you read Screwnomics, it would be wonderful if you could post something on Amazon and Goodreads, but come and buy your books here if you can. Um, I know electronic versions are available too, but um, I, you know, I like those old paper ones. Um, so I want to uh, also uh, thank so many people. There are two pages of acknowledgments in Schoonomics because I have been, I see so many dear friends here from um, Vermont College, some of whom, you know, I've talked to them about these issues and their eyes have kind of glazed over and they've tolerated it, you know. But they've also encouraged me. Um, Ann Stanton, who is my dean over here, um, I said to her, uh, is it all right if I combine um, literature and economics? You know, most people would say, absolutely not. That's not your training, Ricky. And she said, yes, you go for it. So it's really, it's really her fault and also the fault of all my, my wonderful colleagues at, um, and my students at Vermont College where we um, engaged all the time in vigorous dialogue where we had um, intensive conversations about what really, really mattered to us. So that's where this book has really come from. Um, and also, I have to point out uh, Suzanne Gillis, who's back here in the, in the corner. She's the publisher of Vermont Woman and too seldom recognized, I think, for her more than 30 years. Um, <laughs> the one who, um, who decided to send that, that series into the National Newspaper Association. I won this award, or Vermont Woman won this award, and uh, Margaret Mishnewitz encouraged me to, yeah, you, you write another one, Ricky. Go ahead, you know. <laughs> and, um, I, and so my getting that award just kind of went straight to my head, you know. <laughs> and, and I thought about, people would say, well, when, when are you going to uh, write a book about this, Ricky? And I thought, well, I probably should, but you know, even that that series of um, articles and that objective newspaper voice that speaks a little like, you know, I'm being very facts only and I want to report to you the facts of the situation, that didn't really fit how I felt <laughs> about the economy. I really wanted to make it personal, I wanted to make it... Um, conversational. I wanted to be a little snarky, I admit it. I wanted cartoons. I wanted to laugh at what was often absurd. And, um, and so the book is kind of a strange mixture of uh, memoir. My, my story is in it. My mother and my grandmother's story is in it. Those stories of many women involved with the economy are in it. Um, and, and these are women you know, I call, I call this book in a way uh, a female body of knowledge because women, in fact, have been uh, thinking and talking a lot about the economy, but they mostly, they're like Cassandra. You know that story? Uh, they're just not listen to. They'll say, Troy is going to be destroyed if you don't do something, and nobody would listen to them. So um, I, I want to... Um, tell you that this, this, I'm, I'm sort of a, a translator for a lot of economic thinking that um, is, is maybe um, not as accessible as Schoonomics is, but I hope Schoonomics will be a kind of jumping off point for you to, to get involved in a, in a more detailed conversation. So um, I mentioned uh, you, you've all met Pico Todd. Pico, stand up and say, tell us what why in God's name you get involved in Schoonomics. <laughs> Well, that's a long story, but um, I, what I like to say is I saw the name of the book and said, anything with screw in the title, um, <laughs> all right. All right. It's all right. So I want to introduce you. This is my high-tech... Um, Your PowerPoint. Yeah, right. Well, this is more dependable. Anything that's electronic begins to freeze up and it senses my fear, you know. So th these are our three main characters um, that uh, Pico and I created as we thought about, you know, well, how can we uh, create this kind of mini-series within the book? And we worried that it, it might be too much, but I think it, I think it really works. And they're at the end of each 
of the chapters. And this is one of our Sunday tunes. We have a Facebook page and a, and a blog, and um, we have these one-panel cartoons, which I love. Uh, this one, turkey sandwiches, turkey soup, the best part of Thanksgiving, leftovers. And Jess says, sometimes this economy makes me feel like a leftover, but the best part is knowing we're all in the soup together. Um, <laughs> So this is Kashanda, who has uh, come back to uh, Vermont after um, finding the music business too hard in California, and she's got a new band called uh, Kashanda and the Not So Neoliberals. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then this is Jess, who is a, a single uh, mom. She's got a couple of kids, and she's on the um, the welfare program, which is called uh, Get a Group. Get a Grip program, yeah, get a grip. And this is Suki, who is our proverbial uh, blonde bambo, and pay no attention to the color of my hair. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, Suki is, um, she's married to the antagonist of our series, which you'll, whom you'll meet in a, in a little bit. But she's thinking, you know, she's got, pretty much got it, got it uh, figured out because she's married somebody who's got a lot of money. <laughs> okay, so um, those three characters, um, I've already thanked people. I've got so many more people I'm going to embarrass later on. Um, I think I've already said that uh, Screwnomics is unusual because it's got stories in it, because it's about women. It's kind of unusual for an economics book to be aimed at women. Uh, an example I like to give is this great book by uh, Thomas Piketty that got a lot of attention, 20, uh, Capital in the 21st Century, all about economic inequality, a really important book about how this is um, a mathematical um, uh, phenomenon that is just going to keep getting worse and worse and we need to pay attention to it. Uh, 700 pages long seven index le uh, references to women or females in, in the book. So it's not typical for women to play a big part in economic books. So I think that makes <coughs> Screwnomics a little different. Um, for me, what made this subject interesting was what all around me, uh, invisible like the air, being applied everywhere, but never spoken about was what I had to name Screwnomics, the economic theory that women should always work for less or better for free. And that includes our Mother Earth, who's also, you know, we never call, call her uh, Father Earth. She's always Mother Earth. And also men who do those jobs like nursing or teaching, why do we value those? Why do we discount those, those jobs that have traditionally been Female. So I wanted to figure out, you know, how did we get here? What, what's the story behind that? It's a, it's a long story going back 40,000 years, as it turns out. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you a, a story from the book about my life and what got me started asking that question. So this is from Chapter 1, titled, Talking Dirty About Dirty Secrets. The bargain of women's work comes cheap while other prices inflate and go up. Dressed in my business suit and new earrings, embarrassed and tentative, I take a seat in my local Michigan welfare office waiting room. It's 1979, and my shock at being there at all is met by the greater surprise in the eyes of other waiting faces darker than mine and with eyes sadder than mine. I'm ashamed of how well off I must look, dressed in earrings and business suit, sticking out in the company of those darker mothers in t-shirts, surrounded by young children, but also by how well I am treated by the all-white social workers. They rush me into a private meeting room, leaving those who've been waiting, waiting. At the time, I didn't think monetary policy mattered to me or to those other moms in the office. I assumed my ignorance of the difference between macro and microeconomics must mean that I shouldn't trouble my pretty little head. I was part of the economy, but too busy 
working to think about something I mostly found intimidating. I thought more about my own budget scrawled out in pencil on a yellow pad, its numbers adding and subtracting, but mostly subtracting. Despite working full time, same as my ex-husband did, I couldn't make my budget work. I couldn't support my three children on my wages and child support of $25 a week. I was scared and felt guilty. What was wrong with me? Luckily for me, by the time I joined the company of the low income, working women had begun to challenge economic divides. In 1982, here in Vermont, for instance, I would learn that women as a group made 59 cents on a man's dollar in the workplace. This helped explain my economic situation in a larger way than my personal failures. I began to see that some people's success was made harder or even impossible. Race prejudice does play an important role in poverty, but I am not in the minority nationwide. The greatest numbers of poor in the U.S. are white, like me, and are often working single moms. Blacks and Hispanics are poor at more than twice the rate as white people, however, just as women are more likely to be poor than men. Unmarried women with children are among the poorest, women of color in that situation the most likely to be extremely poor. Eventually I would join others to make change, but that year I was on food stamps and welfare. I only felt shame. So along with women's stories like, like mine and my mom and my grandma who were uh, working women at a time that you know wasn't particularly cool to be a working woman, um, Screwnomics explains the basics of economic vocabulary and practices. Uh, and here's another important piece to think about from that first chapter. It's in a sub uh, with a subhead called Male Voice of Money. As the outspoken feminist Andrea Dworkin once put it, money speaks, but it speaks in a male voice. I began to see it does matter very much that those who run our national economy and shape its fiscal policies serve a particular insider group of a particular class and a particular race and gender. Three decades after my initial wake up, UVM economist Stephanie Seguino confirmed that the pattern I had first noticed in the political realm applied to economics as well. It is one of the dirty secrets hidden under our noses that this book is about. I had to invent a new word to more easily describe the ultra-masculine, ultra-rational mindset that has become a social construct of our time, the pale male voice of money and privilege, econo-man. <laughs> Okay, I think this is a good time for us to, to meet uh, Suki's <laughs> husband. We named him Blaze Bernays. <laughs> <laughs> and he, his business card said, it's your right to profit no matter who pays. <clears throat> Oops, lost my place here. Um, so let me now show you the real thing. This is Blaise Bernays, the cartoon, but there's a real Economan too, and I'm going to show you one of them. And, and I show you others, but this is a guy that I really love. Anybody know who that is? What? Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman. And uh, this uh, expectations adjusted Phillips curve illustration, which I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is that from? Do you know? Uh, it's from the 1976 Nobel, uh, or what I call the almost Nobel award um, for economics. And, and this is from his, um, his lecture. Uh, at the Nobel Awards. So let me read you a little bit about, um, about Milton. By the time Ronald Reagan was re-elected president in 1984, I had witnessed a transformation in how our government viewed the economy. 
Reagan's favorite economist, Milton Friedman, had promoted trickle-down prosperity for all, theorizing that cutting taxes on the rich would soon eliminate the need for government safety nets by growing the economy. It sounded good. What had been called voodoo economics by President George Bush I became the greatest thing since sliced bread. I later learned this economic pivot had actually begun in 76 when Friedman was catapulted into fame for this Nobel Prize in Sweden. That award is living proof that Economan really does count on most of us not paying close attention. <laughs> Economics was never included in Alfred Nobel's recognition for noteworthy endeavors established in 1895. In 1969, the Swedish Central Bank created its own separate award, the Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel, timed rather cunningly to blur its difference from the older original awards for chemistry, physics, literature, and peace. Until recently, when the Nobel family protested, the press had routinely left out this detail, apparently considering the banking world's conflict of interest in elevating the field of economics <laughs> irrelevant. Friedman sought to link economics to a physics of natural forces, describing its parts with complex mathematics. The award he received posed, helped pose his prescriptions as something loftier than power and politics, and in terms less disputable, more like gravity and momentum. In other words, the lying notion that a class of privileged men did not create these ways of thinking or at all benefit from them. Rather, he only described inevitable natural laws, you know, <laughs> like the natural law that says a woman without a man should live in poverty. And of course, the, the statistics that you are seeing here in this uh, Phillips uh, curve are from the nation of uh, Chile, which, um, if, if you know anything about that history, he was an advisor. His first customer was General Pinochet in, in Chile, and there's more about General that. <clears throat> okay, so now I want to explain to you in great depth about the um, the coaxials that you see. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But this is an example of what I am calling um, economansplaining, which is uh, from uh, Rebecca Solnit's great essay, Men Explain Things to Me. Um, and that's where we got that term, mansplaining. There, there's a lot of economansplaining going on. Um, now, lest you think that I am being too hard on men and on poor Milton and Suki's blaze, who's perfectly nice guy, I'm sure, and he's due to inherit millions. I'm sure he's going to do lovely things with it. But um, these guys are not what I'm calling Economan. Economan is a hyper-masculine ideal that we have created, a social construction that I believe is operating at a half-conscious level and harming the majority with its assumptions. In the big picture, Milton and Blaze are pikers, okay? They really are. <laughs> so I want to talk about another part of screwnomics, which are the, um, the definition boxes that you'll see in the book that um, you can read or you cannot read. It depends on what you're interested in. There are about 50 of these boxes in the book explaining um, Complicated things like uh, derivatives and um, what are some of the names, uh, energy swaps and that sort of thing. But this is a simple one, millions, billions, and trillions, because I think so many of us really don't appreciate the enormous, they sound kind of alike, millions, <laughs> billions, trillions. You know, it starts to add up and add up. I don't think we really, really uh, appreciate uh, the enormous difference there is, and it's easier to see if you translate it into time. So if you take um, uh, each dollar and trans make it a second in time, and you translate that money into time, this is what you come up with. A million is a thousand thousands. 
So you count each single dollar as a second in time. One million seconds gives you 12 days, okay? A billion is a thousand millions. I'm going to stand in front of this so you can see it. <laughs> so um, how, how much do you think that adds up to? How much time does that add up? 12 days is a million. How much is a billion? Huh? No, it's 31 years. 31 years of time, that big of a difference. Now, what do you think a trillion is? It's a thousand billions. A thousand billions. Thirty-one thousand six hundred and eighty-eight years. Yeah. So that trillion figure, remember, is that uh, that deficit figure that our new tax mm -hmm. bill has given us coming up <laughs> soon with the Federal Reserve uh, talking about raising interest rates soon. So. Um, it's kind of interesting to think about that, especially when you look at where the rest of us are. Now, um, I'm going to pick on Bill Gates a lot because I like to. <laughs> he, he used to be the, the, the biggest billionaire that we had. Now, I understand Jeff Bezos is now the biggest, right? He's uh, the, the guy who owns Amazon, right? But uh, Bill Gates, in 2008, when the big meltdown happened, you know, well, this is before the big meltdown. In 2008, he had $46 billion. Now, how much time do you think that is? <laughs> it is 1,426 years all for himself, okay? So, um, now what do you think he has? After 2008, you know, everybody crashed, everybody lost money. Uh, what happened to poor Bill Gates? <laughs> he now has, reportedly, $86 billion, almost double what he had before the meltdown. And we have now a record number of millionaires and billionaires, not only in this nation, but around the world. Um, and that's that phenomenon that um, Piketty was talking about. At the same time, oh, I guess I should ask you, has your income doubled <laughs> since 2008? Anybody here that want to? No. We only just, this last year, caught up with what we were making in 2008, and the figures in 2008 were stagnated. They've been stagnated since the 1970s, okay? So um, the median American household income in 2008 was $57,211, or the equivalent of how much time? 16 hours. 16 hours compared to, you know, 12 days. Can, you, you get the picture. Um, and keep in mind, this is a household income, which more often than not represents not just one paycheck, but two, maybe three paychecks. Uh, half of all Americans make less than that, because that's the median, what's, what's in the middle. And the female half of that half had the least in assets, in income, and in time. You know? So um, I am now out of time because I want us to be able to um, field your questions and uh, hear your comments about all of this. And um, uh, I, I do want to just say quickly before uh, we do that that this isn't only, Screwnomics isn't only bad news. Um, I, I, I do talk about. Uh, wonderful uh, solutions that many people are already coming up with that are seeking to unscrew the economy and uh, make it work a little better uh, for everyone um, and, and more inclusively. And I'm talking about things like new corporate structures, uh, new labor uh, organizations that are more inclusive, um, uh, more responsible investing possibilities and different forms of financing local businesses and um, banking in the public interest is a big interest in uh, our book, uh, in, in my book and um, I, I even found this Swedish bank that actually 
has figured out how to cut housing costs in half to help build assets more quickly, which is kind of cool. Um, so uh, I also talk about a 30-hour week standard, which was passed in 1933 by our Senate. Most people don't know that. Most people get scared when I talk to them about that possibility because they say, well, I, I'm not making enough money now. I can't afford to go live on 30. Well, we should think about getting a livable wage for 30-hour work weeks, um, which sounds impossible, doesn't it? How could we no. ever do Other that? Countries do it, yeah. But we have yeah. been told it's impossible before. And um, the you know folks who are working 12-hour weeks, seven, uh, 12 hour days, seven hours, uh, seven days a week, we're told an eight-hour day was impossible. Um, we, we, we can do it. And as Susan B. Anthony said, failure is impossible because if we continue on the path that we're on now, uh, we're, we're looking at big trouble for our planet, for our climate, for uh, our grandchildren. So. Um, that's all I'm going to say for now. Okay. <laughs>
There is an organization that is researching the value, the real values of jobs, the New Economics Foundation in England. There are a lot of great organizations. And yes. an example that I've remembered since reading the report, I don't know if they've done it, updated it since, but was sanitary, a sanitation worker or a cleaning lady or cleaning lady in a hospital contributes $17 to the economy versus a tax lawyer who takes $47 out of the economy for every hour or whatever. It does comparisons like that, so it shows the real value of jobs. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. New Economics of, Foundation. Is, yeah. They do a lot of really interesting research. They do, they do. And I, well, while I'm looking at you, I, I need to mention the way we account for things with the GDP. <coughs> that needs yeah. to change, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, discounting <laughs> money and not counting other things of great value, um, like gross national happiness. Um, and uh, there's, there's a, a new, um, the social economic indicators, uh, economic, social wealth economic indicators called Sway that uh, Rian Eisler and her Center for Partnership Studies is uh, working on that, you know, not only shows um, the value of those other things, but of community and family, and, and uh, but also shows the economic results of that. I mean, instinctively, I think we know that if everything is disintegrating, if our communities and our families can't hold it together because of the economic stress they're under, that 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 isn't good for the economy overall, generally. But um, we have to see the numbers. We have to be able to prove it. So. There are lots and lots of ways that people are already working that are very exciting to, to think about. So um, I don't know about you, but aren't you ready for some cake? <laughs> <laughs> but get a picture before they come. <laughs> Me too.